I, I was a little bit remiss, and I, and I don't have a, a full background for today's presenter. We're lucky to have Mike Fontenot to present. He's from the Fairmount Fire Protection District uh, up in Colorado. Um, but I'll, Mike, I'll let you uh, give a little bit more about your background because except for the rave reviews you got at the FEMO workshop we held recently, um, I don't know as much about your background as I'd like to. So I'll turn it over to you. And um, oh, sorry, I should say one other thing, and that is um, for participants, we do have a chat window, and some of you have already used it, but feel free to type questions here, and um, uh, we will save most of them um, for the, uh, the uh, question and answer period at the end. So with that, Mike, I'll, I'll turn it over to you, and you have the floor. Thank you. Maybe you're still on mute. Hang on. About now, can you hear me? Yep, now we can hear you. Thank this you. Great. All right. Well, uh, thank you very much. My name is Mike Fontenot, and like Xander said, I'm with Fairmount Fire Protection District in uh, Golden, Colorado, and we're going to talk about using small unmanned aircraft on wildfires. What I have is a, a presentation with a lot of embedded video. As we go through, just so you know, as we go through these um, slides, there's going to be video on most of these that um, I'll play as we get to them. But um, so let's get started. Uh, my my background is I've been wild in wildland fire since '02, and I'm with Fairmount. I'm a volunteer year-round, and I'm a seasonal paid. My primary duties these days for about the last six years is in the communications unit. I'm a communication unit leader and a comm tech, and uh, I was on a hand crew for 10 years before that. But I deploy in the summer times. They they send me out on uh, wildfire assignments, and I go do that. And for the last several years, three or four years, I've been working on unmanned aircraft, and I'm the unmanned aircraft team lead for Fairmount. We have a drone program that we use for wildfire structure, hazmat search and rescue, and we've been growing that over the last two years. I'm also on a Type 3, our Jefferson County Type 3 incident management team in the comm unit there. And um, in 20. 14 and 2015, I was responsible for a unmanned aircraft research project for the for the sheriff's office there that led to a COA and um, and we flew a fixed wing aircraft. And I'm also an FAA sport pilot. I've been um, a pilot since 2005, and so pretty much anything to do with aviation, I'm all about it. I love it. Okay, so what kind of drones are we talking about today? Today we're going to talk about small unmanned aircraft, and there is quite a range, and as time goes by, we're getting more and more options in terms of unmanned aircraft that are becoming available to um, agencies like ours and the public in general. But I want to be clear, today we're talking about small unmanned aircraft. As you can see at the top, $2,000 to $60,000. That's a, that's a rough, kind of a rough number, but it gives you an idea of some of the aircraft, both fixed wing and multi-rotor. And we are not talking about those very expensive um, aircraft at the bottom that are only available to James Bond. Um, there, those are being used on some of the larger Type 1 and Type 2 fires, and um, I think it was just this year there was a call when needed contracts have been issued to three or four vendors to provide these large uh, unmanned aircraft to um, fires where it's suitable. But um, right now we're talking about what today I'd like to talk about, small unmanned aircraft that you and I can field. Okay, in the course of developing unmanned aircraft policies, NWCG and, and DOI, they've put together quite a few documents, and one of them is a, is a classification, a typing, um, type one to type four. Today we're focused on the type four and type three. And, and what I find interesting is this was published probably a year and a half, maybe two years ago, and a lot of aircraft that were type four because of things like limited flight time because of battery, they're moving into the type three because technology is improving. Either the batteries are becoming more efficient or the aircraft themselves are becoming more efficient. So um, the classifications aren't hard and fast and in fact they are changing, which I find interesting. In terms of fielding unmanned aircraft, you know, what, who's going to fly these things? Um, and, and there's been a lot of d debate about 
embedding unmanned aircraft capabilities in a crew, in a hand crew themselves, and have the crew fly it versus a dedicated drone module where you have um, a specialty skill set that's then tasked out to um, different units on the fire. And primarily the second option is what is, is, seems to be happening. Um, quite a few of the larger incidents of type one and type two is there is a dedicated drone module and they're, they're tied into the operations, they tie in directly with operations or they tie into the SIT unit and receive mission direction from, uh, from that SIT unit. I, I ran into one crew last summer, I was on the Sharps fire in Idaho and a, I think the Pioneer Hotshots out of Alaska, they had their own drone in their, in, in their crew and they had a pilot to fly it. Um, but in my experience, that's been a little bit unusual. I, th I think as the technology and the regulatory um, scene gets um, fleshed out a little bit more, I think we might see more crews have their own drones. But um, you know, on, on the larger scale of things, I believe the, the specialized drone module unit is gonna be used primarily. Okay, so let's talk about missions and we're gonna focus on operations first. There's a number of um, a number of missions that the small unmanned aircraft are suitable for and uh, easily fielded, um, makes for some really efficient use of the tool itself uh, to tie in with operations. So let's just go down the list. The, um, the division or crew level reconnaissance is one of the main drivers. And so, okay, so here's, there's a video here. So what we've got essentially is if, if you're starting a shift or you're planning work, your crew is planning work or division is planning work today. With the small MA aircraft and a drone module team, you essentially have aircraft tasked to your crew. And you know, that's a little bit of a mindset change that we've had in the past, right? You wanted an observation flight, you had to go through operations and you had to get stacked up with the other requirements for um, air resources. And, and now with the small unmanned aircraft and being able to field a drone module, essentially crews and divisions can have their own air asset and, and use them as they see fit. Um, it's talking to people, it's a little bit of a mindset change. And the value in being able to get an overview, an aerial overview of your work area and um, before the shift starts or, or while the shift is, is ongoing is a pretty valuable thing. Okay, <clears throat> continued um, with this idea of monitoring crews and being able to, um, to have that eye in the sky above crews. As the shift is ongoing, you know, being able to put an unmanned aircraft up, see what the crews are doing, see where they're moving um, in the fire in relation to the fire. It just continues to give the um, crew boss and division soups that additional situational awareness helps them make good decisions or make better decisions, and frankly, helps keep people safer. Um, route access. So getting to the fire, getting to a work area, um, in many cases, you know, no one has been out there yet, not sure what the roads look like, um, and, you know, driving into unknown territory can be a little bit of a, of a risk. And so being able to use a drone to scout out road access um, is, a, is a very handy tool and it adds to the safety and the confidence of the people who are asked to go out and do that. A lot of things we find over time, um, you know, looking, looking at the ground from, for example, Google Earth, is a lot of the maps that we see in Google Earth for these remote areas where a lot of wildfires take place, the imagery is out of date. It's not, it's not current really at all. And so having that eye in the sky where you can see what's really going on right now today is a, uh, is a safety boost. <clears throat> this is a photo, in particular, this, this photo um, was from a mission where a fire had burned on a mountaintop all night and the, um, the ops chief wanted to know if the road to the top of this mountain was still open um, there was a lot of burning activity still going on and, and it was early in the day, so it hadn't even heated up to um, to where it was going to be later in the day. And so what we were able to do is we were able to fly the road with the drone and look for downed trees and, you know, any particular 
um, particular fire across the road. It, there was some infrastructure at the top of this um, mountaintop as well, and they wanted to know if that had been impacted by the fire. So instead of sending people up, we were able to send the drone up the road, and um, all these trees that were down or causing problems, we could GPS tag them and, and give that kind of information. So this was a real boost as, as far as not having to send people into a dangerous environment and sending a piece of equipment up there to do it. As the, um, as the shift is ongoing itself, you can put the drone in the air to monitor the crew's work, um, especially if it is a risky, um, dangerous environment. It gives you a little bit more essay on what's going on, what the crews are dealing with, and um, the ability to you know, adjust your tactics during the shift as necessary. Um, one other example, if uh, this crew is hiking out to go look for additional hotspots, you can follow them with the drone. You can send the drone out to um, also look for hotspots and then communicate with these crews on the ground to, uh, <clears throat> to direct them towards potential hotspots. Okay. This mission um, was to monitor the rate of spread. So again, the, the uh, ops chief wanted to know how fast this flame front over on your right was progressing towards these engines and equipment on the left. And um, just for reference, this is about 350 feet above the ground with a, with a drone. So what we did is we basically flew that drone to the edge of the flame front, put a GPS point, and then came back half an hour later and flew it again and measured the GPS point. And then we were able to develop a rate of spread and chains um, based on that uh, flame front movement. And know if we had, you know, do we have something to worry about or do we have plenty of time to, to move equipment as we need? Another mission is uh, simply smoke monitoring uh, and dispersion. A lot of our lookouts are, are also FOBs, or they're doing double duty, and they're interested in this kind of information from a, you know, from a, a smoke standpoint, a dispersion standpoint, especially during prescribed fires. It's important to monitor that and, and keep everyone apprised of where that smoke is going and, and how it's developing. The area Michael, picture gives you... Yeah. Sorry to interrupt. I, a question came in on the chat window that I thought might be uh -huh. worth addressing now. And that is, yep. uh, what type of platform are you using for the, the videos that you're showing here? Can, is is okay. it a simple way to describe the what, drone? The, the two drones um, that we've used in all the videos that you're looking at here, they're both made by a company called DJI. And uh, one is a DJI Inspire, and the other one is a DJI Mavic. They're both- Great, um, thank you. Yeah. I don't have my chat window open, so I appreciate you jumping in and letting me know. And, and I was going to say, I, I don't know if you want questions during the during this presentation, or do you hold them to the end? I don't. I don't have a preference. I'm happy to talk about whatever questions come up as we as we get there. Yeah, I, I think we'll hold most of them to the end. But I thought, well, people okay. are looking at the the images. Okay. it's nice to know what yeah. what platform they're from. Yep. Um, those drones, they have, uh, they have very high resolution cameras, really high quality cameras, and um, take good photos and videos. It's another picture, a little bit higher altitude, about 400 feet above the ground, but it gives you an idea of what that smoke um, looks like as the, uh, as the burning goes on during the day. So this particular mission, um, let me describe this. We're, we're going to fly to the east, and to the south is a mountainside, and, and fire is burning, burning down the mountainside. And so what they did was they, they built a section of black, a long section of black tied in on that road. <clears throat> and what they asked me to do was they asked me to fly that black and just look for spots that might develop outside that black. And so what we did is we essentially flew from here, it's flying east, but we're flying over the black, 
And in the process of doing this, I was able to create a waypoint route so that I flew it and then it comes back to the home point and then I can refly it again and again. And so we had a way for over a period of a couple of hours to refly this particular area looking for um, spots outside of the black that they had established there. And this was only done with visual. Um, and we're, you know, we're able to see smokes, little puffers that, that do pop outside. We didn't have FLIR in this case, but um, I know other agencies are using FLIR and using it very effectively to do the same thing. And it's a, FLIR is a great tool on a drone for finding hotspots, especially these that are sort of outside of the main fire. You want to, um, sorry to break in again. Oh, I guess you're uh, going to describe it next. <laughs> what's that? Uh, the flare. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. okay. So FLIRS, FLIR stands for forward looking infrared and it's um, a camera that detects heat. And what we've got here, these are firefighters with grip torches dropping fire on the ground. Um, it's not a very high resolution. Uh, we were actually loaned this FLIR camera for a fire from a company in Salt Lake City. They were nice enough to loan it to us. Um, but you can see the firefighters sweeping his uh, his drip torch at the head of that um, at the head of that path there. But that's kind of what it looks like when you're when you're looking at unburned versus burned. The heat signature stands out in um, in different ways. And what you can do. Um, there are different color palettes that you can assign to what the, the video looks like. So you can have white hot or black hot or red hot. And it essentially gives you a different color palette. Different people visualize heat better in different ways. And, and the, the various color palettes in these FLIR cameras allow you to sort of tailor that to whatever you think is best for the operator. Typically, these are pretty expensive. FLIR cameras, good FLIR cameras start at about probably $3,000 and they only go up from there because not only do you need a camera um, when you mount this on a drone, you'll need a gimbal to stabilize it and keep the, keep the image steady. The whole unit itself tends to be pretty expensive, anywhere from about $4,000 to $10,000 or $12,000 for kind of the standard FLIR cameras that fire departments are using these days. This is, a, this is something I just found out about back in October. This is a PSD drone. So um, a company in Kansas developed um, a large hexacopter, six, a six rotor um, hexacopter <coughs> to drop PSD spheres um, and you know, create fire. So they were actually able to use it on the Klamath fire last, in last year's fire season or this year's fire season. Uh, very effectively. One of the key things is that it was a type, I think it was a type one fire. So they had a TFR and they were able to get permission from the FAA to fly at night and fly beyond line of sight. And so, you know, when everybody else uh, aviation wise has to land, um, these, these folks are out flying at night and um, using, this, using this drone to drop uh, PSD spears. This is a, from their website. This is just a little a marketing video from them, but basically they can define waypoints um, across the ground and they can um, specify how many spheres per minute are dropped. And it's the same exact spheres that goes into a PSD helicopter ship. It's the same technology, just reduced down into um, to being carried by a drone. And I think they carry about 150 spheres is what they're capable of. Any questions so far on what we've seen, sort of focused on operations? One question okay. came in, maybe this is a good time to tackle it. And uh -huh. um, sure. Jeremy was just asking whether fixed wing drones were more popular than rotor wing drones. And maybe, maybe this is a good yeah. place to sort of touch on the differences. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, right now, I would say that the, uh, the multi-rotor drones are quite a bit more popular than the fixed wing. And there's a couple of reasons. Um, for one, the multi-rotors tend to be smaller, um, more easy, easier to field, easier to carry them in equipment cases out into the, 
you know, rough terrain, and then launch them vertically and land them vertically. A lot of benefits to having that capability. The fixed wings tend to fly longer. Um, obviously, they need a place to launch and land. And so the fixed wings tend to be more suited towards uh, longer range missions and longer flight time missions. And th this kind of is a break between um, a type one and two incident and a type three incident. So on the federal incidents, you typically a TFR will get set up. And what can happen in the, in the TFR is that the drone team or the uh, aviation team, they can request um, waivers to the normal unmanned aircraft regulations that include being able to fly at night and be able, being able to flew, fly beyond line of sight. And so when you have those two capabilities, um, something like a large fire perimeter mapping is more suited towards a long flying fixed wing. And, and so you'll see the fixed wing aircraft. Um, I, I, you know, earlier in the presentation, I mentioned the, um, the more expensive aircraft. There are other aircraft that, you know, don't cost $900,000 that are fixed wing that will fly for, for um, several hours and, and can do mapping. Um, but the capability to fly them or the, re the regulatory requirements to fly them require the TFR an emergency um, emergency authorization from the FAA. There's just a number of regulatory steps that make it more difficult um, for something at a type three and below level. Does that make sense? Yeah, that, that's a good uh, explanation. And maybe if you could, another question came in and maybe you could expound on it. Um, yeah. is, in your experience, or have you heard anything about um, uh, fixed wing or, or uh, rotor drones uh, in their connection to disturbing wildlife? I don't know if you've ever had to deal with, say, spotted owl habitat or something like that. Yeah. Um, I have heard about it, and uh, I haven't heard about it so much on wildfires. You know, um, I mean, I know we do. We deal with these kinds of things um, on wildfires, and I mean, you, you have that issue, you have, um, um, you know, wilderness infringement, archaeological sites, but those are something that, um, that we are concerned about and, and interfering with wildlife, we are concerned about that kind of thing. I, I don't have that much experience on a type one and two fires. On type three fires, we really haven't run into it. Other, other than I can tell you, in my own district, we have two mesas in our, in our district and a lot of our um, search and rescue and emergency response happens on top of those mesas <clears throat> because in the summertime, a lot of mountain biking goes on and people go off, off the road and, you know, break a leg or something like that. And they're, they're kind of trapped on top of this mesa. They can call, they can call 911, but they can't move anywhere. So they, you know, we've used the drone to, to basically do search and rescue to find them on top of the mesa. But one of the things we ran into was we had, um, an eagle habitat on the north side of the mesa, and we were not allowed to fly there for certain times of the year. We try to do training. Um, so in that particular case, we had to enter the mesa from um, the southeast side and proceed from there. But we try to do training in the district all over the district, and we have to, we have to schedule it around when those um, nesting areas are closed or not. So maybe a little bit of a long-winded answer, but it is, it is a factor and it, it is considered. Great, thank you, Mike. And, okay. a, and an yep. another question came up that um, actually somebody else in the chat window may have answered, but just to get your take on it. Um, uh -huh. There's an issue about uh, DJI platforms um, uh -huh. be, and their um, security concerns because of data right. being stored on servers right. in China. Do, do you want to comment right. on that at all? Yeah, I'd, I'd be happy to. So that that is kind of the break between um, the federal use of federal use of BGI drones and everybody else, like um, like a, a fire department like my own or a sheriff's department. Typically, uh, well, I do know that the government, the federal government, right now has a ban on DJI drones because of the security concerns. And I've heard they're working on a couple of different ways to try and and get around that. One they're trying to talk to DJI themselves to, to create software that is essentially isolated from 
um, external server communications. And then the second option is writing their own software, you know, hiring someone or contracting with someone to write their own software for the DJI drones that completely skip any kind of communication back to China. Um, that's an ongoing issue. I know a lot of Fed folks um, in USGS, they really want to fly the, the DJI drones. They're, you know, the price is good. They're high quality. They really have a lot of capability for the um, for the cost, but that restriction on security is is um, a roadblock right now for them. And so they're they're using um, one of the, one of the most popular drones that the Feds are using is a it's called a 3DR Solo, and it's a quadcopter. It's a small quadcopter. Use it quite a bit, and all of their training, their UAS training, is starts with that particular quadcopter. They've added. Um, a fixed wing aircraft recently called the Firefly and it actually can take off and land vertically but then fly horizontally like an aircraft so it's a it's a combination aircraft and then they have a couple of helicopters they they look like they look like a regular helicopter but you know about 3 or 4 feet long and all of these have um an autopilot operating system that is um isolated and independent and there's not any security issues so um, until I think until you're right, that DJI security issue is resolved by the federal government. I don't think we're going to see DJI drones used by or approved by federal government. Uh, that's a broad that's a broad look at it. Um, I know that at um, the local level, agency levels, the most prevalent drones being used out there are DJI. Uh, Interesting. But, you know, I mean, in my own department, we don't. We don't really have a concern about the security issue. Um, we haven't found it to be an issue for us, the, the fact that it communicates back. So. Yeah, okay, well, thank you. That, 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 that helps, I think. Yep. Yeah, expands yeah. on it. And um, there aren't any other questions right now in the chat window, although I'm okay. sure we'll get some more. So why don't, uh, we'll let you okay. kind of keep going through. Okay, so we'll keep, so we'll move on now. We're gonna move to the SIT unit. What kind of missions? Um, the SIT unit tends to bring forth for um, for the drone module team. So I, I say general burn unit visualization. Again, if you're planning uh, to do burning, um, whether on a you know on an ongoing incident or for prescribed fire, it's a it's a nice idea to be able to to visualize what that topography is going to look like. And Google Earth is quite often um, out of out of date. So this is a this is a picture of a burn unit, and we were flying for um, we were tasked with some FEMOs for this. They just wanted to get eyes on what the actual burn unit looked like, um, this, the density of vegetation out there, what the what the vegetation type was, and what it looked like. Um, also, uh, on these longer term missions for the SIT unit, this is an ortho an ortho photo of a section of a particular burn unit. So an, an ortho photo is a, a GPS reference high resolution photo. Um, and we, we take a series of very specific images um, looking straight down. They're all nadir photos and they, they overlap. And software is used to process this into one large image, high resolution image that every point in the image is geo referenced. So it can be used for volume measurements, for area measurements. Um, it can be used for uh, vegetation density. And I'm gonna zoom in on this one. Oops, sorry. This is zoomed in on the same ortho photo. So you can start getting uh, a picture of how much burn actually took place within that unit and, um, and make some calculations to, to see how effective the burning was and see if there's additional areas that need to be you know, continue to be burned. Uh, this is a again the same ortho photo um, rendered as a 3D picture. So, typically the ortho photos these days they can all be rendered into a kind of a 3D image to just give you that visualization of what that particular unit looks like. And I I will point out if you look at these trees they look kind of odd. Um, I'm finding most of the uh, vendors that produce these 3D images 
it's not it's not a perfect science right now. They're working on making it better, but you know sometimes you'll see defined trees or defined mountains or you know whatever the real object is, and then other times you get these these sort of pseudo representations of um, what the vegetation looks like or what a what a hillside looks like. It's just the nature of the technology right now. It's moving forward, but it's it's still not a hundred percent. And in particular, this or the photo was produced by an online um, an online processing service, where we took all the photos and then we uploaded them. And they were stitched together, and it produced this uh, this one giant ortho photo that you can then download and you can consume it in different software, you know, on your own system. Okay, Th this is an experiment I've been working on. So the, at the FEMO um, and the Soro Treks in October. We strapped a uh, kestrel to a, a DJI Inspire and flew it at different altitudes to get um, to get a weather reading, and, and that was kind of interesting. So I I printed up a 3D uh, mount for the kestrel and the weather vane and all that stuff, and have mounted it on a small DJI Mavic. So I'm experimenting with that as as a portable weather station that we can you know we can fly. Uh, you can start at the ground level. And go to 20 foot, get 20 foot winds, and then go to 50 foot. And if you're familiar with the Kestrel, you know you can set the data collection. I think every two seconds at a minimum, and you know you can get weather readings all the way up to 400 feet above the ground, and um, that can provide some useful feedback for weather on the on the incident. This is uh, aero photos of transects. So you can see the two firefighters in the picture. Their transect is in between two of them. They had set these uh, pins out there, and of course they had pictures from the ground. But we flew over them, followed them, and then took these aerial photos. And in talking with them, they can compare the two. And another picture of a transect. What we did in this case was the firefighter on the on the top. He pulled out um, one of the red, uh, you know the um, a helicopter, oh, gosh, I can't remember the term now. Essentially, a, it's a red, um, like a space blanket, so that helicopters can see that for a bucket drop. And then the uh, firefighter at the bottom had a LED flashlight that was pretty bright, and he was able to shine that up at the drone and just give us a little bit more visual about where their location was. Post-fire damage assessment, if you've read anything about the um, the fires in California, a lot of the um, agencies out there are doing this. They're they're using drones to do assessment of the neighborhoods, primarily neighborhoods after the fire, and they're building 3D um, 3D images and panoramic images um, of the neighborhoods after the fire has passed through. And then those are online. People who live in those neighborhoods can log into that and check and get a visual of their neighborhood and their particular um, home. Continue with that. This is a 3D, um, this is a 3D model of a neighborhood in California, the campfire. And so what they've done is they've started with an ortho photo of this whole area and then turned it into a a fly through 3D model. As I was saying, sometimes the 3D isn't quite perfect. If you see this large black area, uh, you know, I'm sure they took pictures of that area, but why it doesn't show up in the model, I'm not sure. And that's not uncommon. It's, um, it happens from time to time. Okay, all right. So this is um, this was an interesting use that I didn't think of. <laughs> I was on the Keystone Fire in 2017 in um, Wyoming, and the logs chief um, he knew he knew I was um, a drone guy and you know ran the drone department for my fire department, and he said. 
I do, I do two things. I build maps. I help plans build maps of the camp. And then also I do a lot of training in logistics outside of the fire season on how to set up camps and things like that. And so essentially what he asked me to do was to take this large stitch photo of the camp um, in Wyoming. And then what we did is we gave it to plans and they took this section out and um, they ended up creating this photo with labels on it for what all these trailers were. So you had, um, you know, you had check-in, you had demo, you had comp claims, you had operations, air ops, communications, the PIO, they were all labeled and essentially created a camp map that went into the IEP, which I thought was a great idea. It was a cool idea of technology. And then this is a video I took of the same thing that this logs chief used for his training um, in another uh, training venue. So to give people an idea of what the camp looks like and how it's laid out, um, this same logs chief um, he's on Rocky Mountain Team Blue, Travis Bailey. I worked for him again this summer and on another fire in Southern Colorado, and we did the same thing. You know, a completely different camp setup, but we did the photos and videos of the camp for um, essentially training. And I think he's going to use it at the Wildfire Academy, at Colorado Wildfire Academy, in January. Okay, um, one other use: uh, PIO, supporting PIOs. So on the Sharps fire in Idaho, um, the Sharps fire was started by um, a person shooting exploding targets. And, and so the local BLM office and got together with the PIO on the Sharps fire itself, and they, they wanted to come up with a series of public service announcements about shoot responsibly Idaho. And they, they had a BLM pilot, and, and I got wind of it, and they asked me to show up because he needed an observer, another, another observer slash pilot to, you know, just to help him fly. And so we went out there to the point of origin and took some aerial video of um, a particular person you, you'll see in this. And they produced this PSA. They actually produced about three or four of them. So the person in the video is a, uh, an endurance mountain biker. And she was asked to, to be the spokesperson for this. And basically the aerial videos are with the drone. It's at the point of origin. And just to give you some idea of what it looked like out there and you know what she was asked to do. And basically she, she talks a little bit about, you know, shoot responsibly Idaho. And, and um, the PIOs were just, they were just flabbergasted. Like they all had ground cameras, everybody's got their phone, but to have the, the drone video in there was, exciting and it just gave them a perspective for this you know for this whole PSA that they really hadn't anticipated so okay uh, any questions so far yeah, a, a little discussion got started in the the chat window um, okay uh, let's see let me see if I can pull back to the beginning here so what 3D or point cloud rendering programs do you find produce the best maps, meaning more realistic okay. your uh, artifacts? Right. Um, right. And just, um, just so you know, okay. a couple comments that came in. Uh, Pix4D, as uh, Jeremy mentioned, is more yep. user-friendly, but Agisoft allows you to parameterize further. Um, and then right. Patrick also kind of uh, chimed in um, with some experiences with both of those. So I don't know yep. what your take is, Mike. Yeah, sure. Um, I kind of divide image processing software up into two different areas. One is um, internet connected, where I upload the photos to a cloud processing service and they process into the files I need and then I download them versus having the software on your computer. So like Pix4D and Photoscan, they run on a laptop or they run on a computer locally they don't require any internet access. Um, for me, those are the two big separators because the majority of the time I'm out in the field, I don't have internet access. And you know, some of the some of the products that you might want to deliver, you know, if you need an ortho um, photo, if, if the if the sit unit needs an ortho photo and you don't have internet access, then you know you're limited. You have to you have to have Pix4D or Photoscan or some other software on your local um, laptop to be able to produce those. If you have internet access, then 
there are more, I would say there are more options available. There's drone deploy, there's um, maps made easy. Both, both of those are very good. There's a company called Propeller Aero that's also very good. Um, they all have different pricing tiers, um, but they all, they all typically produce about the same um, outputs. You know, they produce orthos, they produce uh, digital elevation models, um, and a variety of file formats that you, you can then download and import into your own software and make use of them. So, um, does that help? Yeah, thank you. That's a, a good uh, good overview. I appreciate it. Yeah, and um, it brings up a good point. Quite a bit of the time, we're working in an internet disconnected environment, um, and that has its own challenges in terms of a lot of the flight software uses uh, Google Earth Maps to give you sort of a map background of where you are. And um, if you don't have the internet, you, you, you don't have that. What a lot of the software allows you to do though is, is while you're still connected to the internet, you can kind of scroll around the area you're gonna be flying in and those maps will be cached for some amount of time on your um, iPad or your Android tablet, whatever device you use to actually fly the drone with. And so that's that's one way to sort of work around that. Um, it's it's not 100% successful because no one seems to tell us what the algorithm is for keeping cache maps. You know, we we think they're cache and they work for a morning series of flights, and then in the afternoon I've come back and they're gone. Um, and so it's it's a little bit hit and miss, but. Um, that, that is something to consider. If you're gonna be working um, in the wilderness and there's no internet, test all your, test all your software and your, um, your drone uh, process in that sort of environment so you know what to expect. Yeah, that's a great point. Okay, I wanted to talk a little bit now about some of the limitations of small UAS. Um, and, and these are just the high points, but certainly battery life and flight time. Um, it, it's a limitation right now with the current battery technology. You know, we're just, we're limited anywhere from 15 minutes to an hour is, is pretty typical. And in that limitation, what you have is you have a limitation of how far you can fly, which can limit the type of missions you might want to try to accomplish. You know, small recon, small um, uh, situational awareness type missions of your work area those are great, works very well. But the larger mapping missions, as we talked about, that have to go beyond line of sight or you know, cover 20 to 50 to 70 acres, the small drones are just, they're, they're not a good fit for that. And as I talk about the mitigations for something like that is, you know, use the tool for the, the type of mission you, you're gonna be dealing with. Um, there is a, there's an intersection of success for a small drone in the type of mission. And then if, if, you, have, uh, if you have larger mapping um, requirements, then you're gonna, you, know, you need to move to a larger drone. Visual line of sight, uh, the FAA regulations, really everyone now is moving, if they haven't already, they've moved to flying under the FAA's part 107 remote pilot regulations. Um, for a while before this regulation came into existence in 2016, the FAA was, was um, issuing, um, they call it a, and they still do, it's called a COA certificate of authorization for flying in different environments and um, different agencies. And it was a little bit of a mashup, like um, DOI had agreements with the FAA to fly in certain conditions, um, whereas someone like myself working for a county agency, we had a different set of, of um, requirements and authorizations to fly. And so part 107 has kind of leveled the field and that's become the standard for, for which we then add additional flight needs. Um, and so one of the main ones for, for part 107 is visual line of sight. You have to keep the drone um, in sight from your launch location uh, throughout the flight. There are mitigations for that, and I've done this quite a bit, is you know, when the smoke gets, gets thick, we'll move our launch location. We'll, we'll just move around where we can reposition and, and relaunch the drone to, um, to support the mission as needed. Additionally, if you're going to be um, in a TFR, if, or if you have the ability to um, 
to issue a TFR, you can request additional um, waivers to Part 107 from the FAA, and they're called an ECO, Emergency Certificate of Authorization, where beyond line of sight flying is allowed and night flying is allowed. Um, different payloads, for example, the, um, the PSD drone needed some additional uh, authorizations to be able to fly with a hazardous material, because right now in the standard uh, series of Part 107 regulations, you're not allowed to fly hazardous materials on drones. So Part 107 is a standard, but there are ways to expand its use if you can convince the FAA that you can do it safely. And then simply drone size. You know, drone drones come in a large variety of sizes, and the small ones are easy to feel, they're easy to carry, um, they're easy to maintain. And frankly, they're easy to, to learn how to fly. Um, the larger ones are, uh, they're just more complex. You know, you saw the, saw some of the larger drones, 12 foot wingspan, they require a, a launcher, essentially a catapult type launcher. And then there's, you have to have a place to land them. And, you know, there's a whole crew. It's like a, uh, it, it goes with it. So it's all a trade off. Um, what's the mission? What kind of technology do you need to fly on the drone in terms of sensors? Um, the, uh, I'll give you an example. The, I think it was the Rim fire a couple of years ago in California. You know, there were so many fires that year that it was um, troublesome getting um, IR flights at night. You know, just there were so many fires, not everybody could, could get um, lined up in the task queue to get an IR flight. And <clears throat> the fire was able to contact the um, California National Guard who had a predator that flies at 25,000 feet or something like that. So they were able to do night flights 24 seven um, using the Predator and its amazing technology to do fire line mapping and, um, and just essentially keep tabs on the whole fire. Because one, they could fly for hours. Two, they could fly well above the uh, fire traffic area that everything else was going on in. And three, the sensors that they had on there were, are just amazing. And they were able to do very accurate um, infrared mapping of the entire fire area. So drone size matters. Uh, okay. Um, that's really about all I have. Um, I'm looking forward to any questions. Well, thank you so much, Mike. The excellent presentation. Um, I, I know basically nothing about, well, when we started, I knew nothing about drones. And now I feel like I have at least the basics of what, what questions to ask. So uh, really nice job uh, taking a complex subject and breaking it down. And of course, I, I love the, the, the videos and things. Um, so we have a little bit of time for questions. Um, let's see. Uh, uh, let's see, there's some discussion in the chat window about um, uh, point clouds and, and some of the sort of post-processing. Um, uh -huh. uh, and so I, I, I think that's a, 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 maybe I'll leave that there, um, sort of a nuanced conversation. But if, if folks want to add in other questions, uh, please do so, or you can um, unmute your line and, and go ahead and ask a question verbally if you want. So um, Jeremy uh, typed in a question that says, it seems many fire districts are already utilizing drones for thermal mapping, but do you see a large demand for academic research on the topic? Um, I'm seeing more and more demand for academic research on it. Um, you know, I, I approach it from a from a firefighter standpoint and our the type of missions that we um, support. But as as I've been to more trainings, as I've met more people through these um, trexes, I'm meeting more um, academics that are interested in using um, drones for a variety of things that aren't necessarily that are related to wildfire but not actually an, on an incident. The, the question about point cloud actually kind of jumps into it a little bit. You know, LIDAR mapping has become more and more popular for a couple of reasons. One of them is that the, the price for LIDAR sensors is dropping and their size is dropping. So being able to mount them on drones um, is becoming more prevalent. And that, my understanding, that is giving researchers a lot higher resolution um, for 
in, you know, whatever studies that are appropriate for using LIDAR with, it's just opening the doors to that kind of data collection that wasn't really available before. And, and Mike, along those lines, do you have any experience with um, uh, doing some of the sort of subtraction work to get the before and after models um, with that, that data? Yep, yep. Um, we've done that on some prescribed fire projects where essentially, we, I'll describe what we did. We did an ortho, um, a 110 acre burn area. We flew it before the burn and we used that to, one, introduce people who were gonna participate in the burn, uh, what the terrain looked like, because me most of the people would not see it before the actual um, uh, burning activity. So one, it was a little bit of a training, and then two, we created a digital elevation model from that, and that was used to visualize <clears throat> things like gullies and drainages and areas there that People, people thought we had enough resource, holding resources in a particular area, but after looking at the terrain model in this fashion, realized that we need to put more people in these particular areas because the drainages are steeper and potentially more dangerous uh, funnels than we had thought just by you know walking around on the ground. So, and then afterwards, uh, after the burn was done, this wasn't automated, but um, one of the researchers went in and actually used the the after ortho to calculate how much um, what what the percentage of burn vegetation actually was um, and what i've heard from that is i've heard that there are academics uh, and research going on to try and um, automate that where you can be given an ortho photo of a particular burn area and um, you know, the computer processing can figure out exactly how much has been burned and and, and move that way instead of making it a manual process. I, I see a lot of, um, I see a lot of movement in that area. Interesting. That's great. Um, and uh, uh, Jeremy just typed in uh, that he's currently doing that sort of work with uh, supervised classification. So uh, oh, need to see okay. some, some connections here. Uh, oh, that's cool. Yeah. Well, we're we're just uh, we're at the top of the hour here. Um, and we probably have time if if someone has a, a quick question and is currently typing to to get it in there. Um, but uh, I, I do want to to thank everybody for participating again. And um, one topic that we're exploring for a spring series of webinars is post-fire um, regeneration and, and replanting. Um, so if that's a, an area of particular interest, um, let me know. Uh, we're sort of looking around for different ways to talk about different topics. Um, but regardless, I, I hope to uh, have some of you on future webinars. And uh, Mike, I want to thank you again uh, for a great presentation. Um, oh, and we do have a few more questions. So uh, let's see. Okay. Uh, um, one came in, do you have any contacts or references to recommend about the pre post burn vegetation change modeling? Um, I, can, I can dig some up and I'll send them to you, Xander. Great. Yeah, and I can share them when we send out the um, the recording of the webinar to all the registrants. Okay. Yeah, I can do that. And, and then uh, Nathan had a question about um, how should academic researchers seek approval for using UAVs on active fires, or how could they contact about accessing data from fire districts? Right, right. Um, that's a great question. And let me be clear. So my presentation was on, you know, how are they actually being used? How can you actually use them? The, the subject of how to get authorization to fly is a whole different, it, it just, it would take us another hour to, to talk through that. But, um, you know, the, the, the requirements for flying drones really starts with um, the FAA's part 107 and getting, getting that remote pilot certificate from the FAA, which is an online test is really what it is doesn't require any um, actual skill testing. The, the, the next step after that, after getting your part 107, would be to 
you know, get a drone and get some training on how to actually fly it. And if you if you could get specific mission type of training, that would be even better. Uh, you know, honestly, there's very little of that out there. It's just it's too new. Um, but part 107 is the way to start. That's that's your kind of your gateway into the regulatory world of being able to fly um, legally and in an authorized fashion. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for, did, for highlighting did that. Answer, did, that answer the, did that answer the question? I'm not sure I answered the question. Yeah, I, I think so. And, and I think there, there are um, lots of details about you know how to connect in with um, for for researchers and and folks uh, on active suppression fires, um, and I think that's one of the sort of points of the the Southwest Fire Science Consortium is finding ways, yeah. whether it's things like a Trex where you can build relationships and so um, and you know get yep. your red card and that sort of thing so that you can participate because right. I think it is really important. Um, to have that research management connection even on uh, active suppression fires. Right. Well, if I, if I were a researcher and, you know, there were fire districts in my area, I wouldn't hesitate to just reach out to them and ask them, do you have a drone program? Here's what I'm interested in. Do you have any data you can share? Uh, you know, I know we as a department would be open to that. Um, I mean, we, we have privacy policies in place for the, for the data that we do collect. But something like that, I think, would be um, a viable option. In, in fact, over the summer, we had an intern, a GIS intern, that was helping us create a mapping program uh, for finding launch points, drone launch points, to respond in our district. And so he, he went out with Collector and did a bunch of studies. You know, we gave them a bunch of parameters about how far we could fly and how long they could fly and what areas were closed off based on wildlife habitat and things like that. And, and he came up with a, um, essentially a mapping program that, that laid out different launch points that we could use in response to different events. So that, that was a pretty successful researcher fire department interaction. And uh, you know, I think a lot of departments would be open to that kind of interaction. Yeah, that's great. That's a really neat uh, uh, partnership collaboration there. Thank you. Okay, good. Well, we should probably uh, be respectful of the clock here and, and wrap it up. But Mike, I do want to thank you again. I, I really appreciate you taking the time to put that together. Such a great uh, presentation and everything. Well, thank you very much for having me. I, I, two things I can talk about forever is wildfire and drones. So thank you for the opportunity. <laughs> Great, thanks. Well, maybe we'll, we'll have you back on, uh, you know, as technology is changing so so rapidly in a year or something. All right. Okay, have good. a good day, Thank everyone. You. Thank you.